All right, everybody. Today is fun. But hasn't it all been fun? Okay. Today we will factor polynomials that we once thought were unfactorable. Or by first glance, you're like, you can't factor that. Well, just remember these words. Everything is factorable. Okay? Everything. Some may be more complicated, but today is not about complication. Today it's about learning how to factor four, five, six, seven, maybe even eight term polynomials. Something we've never done before. You've never done before. So it's actually exciting and involves division, synthetic division. Okay. So first up is the division algorithm for polynomials. If f of x and g of x denote polynomial functions, and if g of x is a polynomial whose degree is greater than zero, then there are unique polynomial functions q of x and r of x such that the division of f of x over g of x, and this is nothing difficult, this is everything we've been doing for the past two sections. So whenever you divide two polynomials, you'll always get a quotient plus, guess what? Your remainder over your divisor. Nothing new in this algorithm. Somebody just wanted to put a name to it, right? All right, so that's just normal polynomial division. You get a quotient plus a remainder over the divisor. Or if you wanted to multiply everything by g of x, let's see, would it be, yeah. If you wanted to multiply, let's say, this whole thing by g of x, distribute here, here, and there, we'd come out with a new formula. f of x equals the quotient times the divisor plus the remainder. All right. So don't worry, that all will make sense soon. Maybe not on this one, but maybe in the next section. But this is just saying that you can manipulate the division algorithm in such a way. And r of x is the zero polynomial or polynomial of degree less than that of the, de the denominator g of x. And f of x is the dividend, g of x is the divisor, q of x is the quotient, and r of x is the remainder. So this is just the division algorithm. Okay. So next up is remainder theorem. Let f be a polynomial function, and if f is divided by a linear factor of x minus c, then the remainder is the same as saying f of c. So this is actually really cool because it could save you some time. If you're just looking for a remainder, well then all you have to do, instead of doing long division or synthetic division, is take this value of c, plug it into the function, and you're gonna get the same remainder as you would if you were dividing by long division or synthetic division. So let's go ahead and try it out. Okay. So using remainder theorem that we just saw above, it says find the remainder if f of x is equal to x cubed minus 4x squared minus 5. Okay. So let's just do this. Um, I guess I could show three ways just to show how it works, right? So first thing we're gonna do is we'll do long division first. So let's get that set up. I'll say x minus three, there's my division symbol. Here is my dividend. And you must account for all your missing powers. So you have x cubed minus four x squared plus zero x minus five. Okay, three, two, one, zero. Okay, so all we're looking for here is the remainder. I'm gonna show you three different ways how to get there. Long division, synthetic division, and remainder theorem above. Of course, I'm gonna take through this whole thing and we don't have to do all three anymore. I just wanna show you how it works. Okay, so if I wanna get rid of that, I would multiply by x squared. And if I multiply by x squared, I'd get x cubed minus three x squared. And then you put the line there, it's subtraction, gone, gone. Negative four minus minus three becomes negative four plus three. And I get 
negative x squared plus 0x minus 5. Do the trick again. I'm going to multiply by negative x. That will give me negative x squared plus 3x. Okay, subtraction, gone, gone. 0 minus 3 gives me negative 3x minus 5. And then last part of our trick, I'm just going to multiply by negative 3. Negative 3x plus 9. And here, all we're looking for is a remainder. That's it, just a remainder. Those cancel, negative 5 minus 9. We end up with negative 14. There's my, there's my remainder using long division. Now, let's use synthetic division. So if it's x minus 3, on the outside we'll go the three division symbols upside down. Inside goes my dividend, just the coefficients. 1, negative 4, 0, negative 5. First number always comes down. There's 1. 3 times 1 is 3. Negative 4 plus 3. Remember, operation inside is addition. Negative 4 plus 3 is negative 1. And then 3 times negative 1 is negative 3. 0 plus negative 3 gives me negative 3. And 3 times negative 3 gives me negative 9 which gives us a remainder of negative 14. Same as that, right? Perfect. So we know we're correct if long division and synthetic division, I get the same remainder of four, negative 14. So once again, there's my remainder. Okay. Now, last, because this said, just find the remainder using remainder theorem. So this means that all we have to do is take 3. Remember, we always take the opposite sign. Since it's negative 3, we're going to take 3 and plug it into f of x. And what should happen is we should get the same remainder of negative 14. Insane, I know. Let's watch. So you'll get f of negative, f of 3 equal to 3 cubed minus 4 times 3 squared minus 5. All right, let me open up this. Oh, nope, do it again. There we go. I'll fix it in a sec. F of three equals three cubed minus four minus, minus four times three squared minus five. And this means that F of three is gonna be 27 minus four times nine minus five which will give me four times, well, four, f of three, which is gonna be 27 minus 36 minus five, which gives us negative nine minus five, which, hey, gives us negative 14. Now, was this the remainder that we found when we used synthetic division? Yes. Was this the remainder that we found when we used long division? Yes. So, what remainder theorem says is that, well, if you plug in that linear factor of C, you're going to get the same remainder as if you would using synthetic division or long division. That's it. So, we could have used this and we would have been home already five minutes ago. But, I did synthetic and long division just to show you that we'll get the same remainder no matter what. Okay, so that's what remainder theorem says. That's pretty cool how that works out. 
Okay, you plug the number in and you'll get the remainder. So this means that for x plus two, all we wanna do is find the remainder. So that means all we have to do is say, f of negative two, right? If it's x plus two, then it's gotta be the opposite, negative two. And you'll get negative two cubed minus four times negative two squared minus five. Negative eight minus four times four minus five gives me negative eight minus 16 minus five, and that's negative 24 and negative 29. And there it is. That's our remainder. Using remainder theorem, of course. If you want to check your work, take the negative two and plug it into synthetic division, or take the x plus two and use it in long division. But I'm assuming we don't like long division anymore, right? So old, so ancient. <laughs> okay. Uh, let me check my work. Negative two, that'd be negative six, that'd be 12, and negative 24. Yep, we're good. Okay, moving on. That's remaining there. So all this said was, hey, no need to use long division or synthetic division to find out whether you're going to have a remainder or not. All you do is you take that linear factor, plug it into the function, boom, you get your remainder. Saves time. I like it. You should like it too. Okay. So as a direct consequence of remainder theorem, we have factor theorem. Now I talked about what it means to be a factor in synthetic division. What it means to be a factor is that if you get a remainder of zero, it doesn't matter if you get a remainder of zero using long division, synthetic division, or remainder theorem. If you get a remainder of zero using any of those three methods, you will have a factor. That linear factor of x minus c becomes a factor of the original polynomial. That's all it says. Okay, so factor theorem, let f be a polynomial function, then x minus c is a factor of f of x, if and only if, when you plug in c, or when you use long division, or when you use synthetic division, you get a remainder of zero. That's it, that's all it says. So. One and two basically say the same thing. If f of c gives us zero, then x minus c is a factor of x, of f of x, the polynomial. Two says the thing, two says number one backwards. If x minus c is a factor of f of x, then f, the function f at that linear factor of c must also be zero. So they're basically the same thing, right? So again, keep it simple. If you get a remainder of zero, using any of the three methods, synthetic, long division, or remainder theorem, then you have a factor. Or x minus c is a factor. So let's try it out. Use factor theorem to determine whether the function f of x equals 2x cubed minus x squared plus 2x minus 3 has the factor x minus 1. Well, if we're going to use remainder theorem, then this means that all we have to do is take x minus one and plug it into the function. So if it's negative one, we take one and plug it in. Two times one cubed minus one squared plus two times one minus three. Clean it up. 2 minus 1 plus 2 minus 3, and you get 2 minus 1, which is 1, plus 2 minus 3, which is negative 1. So you get 1 plus 2, which is 3, 3 minus 3. We get 0. This means that if you get 0, this means that using remainder theorem, we plug the value of c in and we got zero, which means that if you use long division or synthetic division, you would also get a remainder of zero, which means that x minus one
is a factor. X minus one is a factor of that polynomial there. That's it. That's all we have to do. And we just completely avoided using long division or synthetic division. Life is great so far, right? Let's say is a factor of f of x. There you go. Okay. Then now we try it for x plus 3. Is x plus 3 a factor? We'll take negative 3 and plug it in, because remember, always think opposite. Plus 3 means we're plugging in negative 3. And you'll get 2 times negative 3 cubed minus negative 3 squared plus 2 times negative 3 minus 3. Negative 3 cubed minus 3 squared plus 2 times negative 3. And you'll get 2 times negative 27 minus 9, minus 6, minus 3, negative 54, minus 9, minus 6, minus 3. And the way this looks is, yeah, we're not going to get anywhere close to 0, right? Negative 54 minus 9 is negative 63, negative 63 minus 6 is 69, and 69 minus 3 is negative 70. Is this number zero? It's definitely not zero. This is our remainder. And what this means is that x plus 3 is not a factor. Not a factor. That's it. How easy could that get that we don't have to use synthetic division or long division to check whether it's a factor or not? Now, this is really, really deceiving though, because once we get to the good stuff of actually breaking down the polynomials, well, if we happen to have a factor, then we still have to throw it into synthetic division in order to break the polynomial down. So maybe this was just a waste of time. Maybe this is just giving us extra steps. Because no matter what, if we do have a factor, then we still have to throw it into synthetic division to break it down, to factor the original polynomial. So I don't know. It's a good check, and it'll let you know what number works in synthetic division. But you still have to use synthetic division. So eh, who knows? Maybe an extra step, maybe not. Maybe helpful. Who knows? We'll try it out when we get there. Okay. Uh, the next theorem concerns the number of real zeros that a polynomial function may have. In counting zeros of a polynomial, we count each zero as many times as its multiplicity. So that means if I had, let's say I had. x plus 5 to the 6, this means that negative 5 would have a multiplicity of 6. That's all that says. That's nothing new. That's everything we know. All right, number of real zeros. We know this theorem already, too. A polynomial function cannot have more real zeros than its degree. That means if I said, how many zeros does x to the fourth have? And you should say, four. Good. A polynomial who is x to the fourth cannot have five zeros, cannot have six zeros. It can't have more than what its number states. If I have x to the tenth, I should have ten zeros, and that's it. No more. So that's all that theorem says. Okay. Next is something called rational zeros. So in our attempt to break down a 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 term polynomial, we need to find something called potential zeros. So to find the potential zeros, or better yet, these potential zeros 
are the zeros that can potentially break down the polynomial function in synthetic division. So when we find these potential zeros, we are going to test them in synthetic division and then break down the polynomial function. Of course, if the zero works. So for now, let's just find the potential zeros of the polynomial functions. And by the definition, let f be a polynomial function of degree one or higher. So once again, you see that awful polynomial form, but remember that this only states highest degree to lowest degree to constant. So all we're really worried about here is the constant and the leading coefficient. Oh, just on that part. So each coefficient is an integer. And if p over q is in lowest terms and is a rational zero of f, then p must be a factor of the constant. So p belongs to all the factors of the constant. And q belongs to all the factors of the leading coefficient. So what we're going to do is take the constant and then take the leading coefficient, find all the factors of these numbers, put them over each other because we put p over q. And when we put all the factors over each other, this is going to tell us what the potential zeros are and what zeros could possibly work in breaking down the function using synthetic division. Okay, so let's try it out. I think we only have one example here. Perfect, good, that's all I need. Okay, so all we're doing here is listing the potential zeros of the given function, 2x cubed plus 11x squared minus 7x minus 6. Okay, so remember that p belongs to the constant. So in this function, what is my constant? The constant is negative 6. Now let's find all the positive and negative factors of negative 6. Starting with plus or minus 1. 1 is a factor of 6. Then plus or minus 2. Then plus or minus 3. Then plus or minus 6. These are all positive and negative factors of negative 6. That's all we have to do there. Q belongs to the leading coefficient. The leading coefficient here is 2. Thank goodness. The only factors of 2 are plus or minus 1, and plus or minus two. And now what we're going to do to find the potential zeros is take P and put it over Q. This means you take all of these factors and put them over all of those factors. You take all the factors of P and you put them over all the factors of Q. So let's start this out. We're going to say all of these factors over the first factor of Q, which is 1. So we start plus or minus 1 over plus or minus 1. Guess what that is? plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2 over plus or minus 1. That's just 2. Plus or minus 3 
over plus or minus one? That's just three. And plus or minus six over plus or minus one is just one. Now let's do it again. We're gonna take all of these factors of p again and put them over the second factor of q. So let's start again. Plus or minus one over plus or minus two. That's plus or minus one half. Plus or minus two over plus or minus two. Two divided by two, we have that already. That's one. Then we move on to the next one. Plus or minus three over plus or minus two. That's plus or minus three halves. And then last one, plus or minus six over plus or minus two. Six divided two, that's three. We have that already. And these are the potential zeros for the given polynomial above. These are the zeros that could potentially break down this function into factored terms using synthetic division. So what this means is that If you counter them, you see that there are two choices of each, positive and negative. This means you would have two, four, six, eight, 10, 12. You would have 12 attempts to get it right. But then, after you find the zero, the right zero the first time and break it down, if it has to be broken down again, you will have 12 more attempts to try and break it down. Exciting, I know, I know. These are called your potential zeros. Okay. So, that was just finding potential zeros. Now let's get to the next problem, because now here's where we put everything together to see where the to see how the fun begins, right? This is where the fun begins. All right. First example. Find the real zeros of the polynomial function 2x cubed plus 11x squared minus 7x minus 6. Hey, that looks familiar. Because we just did it, right? We found all the potential zeros on the last page. But we'll run through it again. Right? f in factored form after you break it down first thing up is determine the degree what is the highest degree of this polynomial function and that happens to be three our degree is three which means how many zeros can we only have we can only have three zeros okay degree is three meaning we should have three zeros. Now, let's go ahead and list the potential zeros again. This means you'll need P and you'll need Q. We zoom in and P is always the constant, so it's negative six. And we list all the factors of six or negative six. Q belongs to the leading coefficient. Q is two. List all the factors of Q. And then you're gonna put P over Q.
And once again, we do the same thing as above. Take all these factors and put them over the first one. So you'll get plus or minus one, plus or minus two, plus or minus three, plus or minus six. And then take all of these, put them over the second factor. And you'd get plus or minus one half and plus or minus three halves. Once again, these are your potential zeros. And we have 12 tries to get it right. Okay, so now here's where I think we can bring in remainder theorem and factor theorem. I was saying it's an extra step because it could possibly be or maybe make our lives easier. But the only way for it to make our lives easier is if you have a calculator on you, right? Because do we really want to attempt synthetic division 12 times? No, we want to get it right. So here's one possible way to do it. Other than plugging numbers in by hand or other than starting the synthetic division out and going all 12 attempts blindly. So. Okay, so what we're going to do in my graphing calculator, TI-84 or the blue calculator, is go to my y equals, and I'm going to type in the function given, 2x cubed plus 11x squared minus 7x minus six. Hit enter, and now I'm gonna hit second and window, and make sure to scroll all the way down so you get to independent, and highlight ask. After you highlight ask, hit enter, and then you're gonna hit second graph. And you'll get an XY chart. If there's numbers there already, delete them. Delete, delete, delete. And now, what I'm going to do to save myself 12 attempts on synthetic division is plug in my potential zeros. And remember, if I plug in my potential zero and the outcome is zero, then that number will work in synthetic division. If I plug in a potential zero and get a remainder other than zero, then that number is not a factor and we do not have to use it in synthetic division. So let's start off with positive one. That's always a good choice. I'll type that in my calculator and hit enter. Oh, look at that. One works. I right off the bat got a zero for the remainder. So that means we can move on straight to synthetic division. So I'll take that zero that I just did of one. Set up my synthetic division. Put in the function given above. Make sure all powers are accounted for still. And only put in the coefficients. 2, 11, negative 7, negative 6. 3, 2, 1, 0. First number always comes down. 2, and then we start the process. 1 times 2 is 2. Operation is addition. You get 13. 1 times 13 is 13 you get positive six. One times six gives me six. We get a remainder of zero, just like the calculator said. Okay, now, what do we do from here? We have to rewrite our quotient back into polynomial format. 
So, we take our quotient and put it back into polynomial format. Now remember, just like synthetic division, all the powers have just been reduced by one. So now this becomes 2x squared plus 13x plus 6. But now here is the catch. Not really a catch, but something you have to remember. We just divided by a linear factor or a, we just did synthetic division by a potential zero of one. You now have to take this poten potential zero and put it into a linear factor. So if we divide it by one, and remember when I say linear factor, I'm saying x minus c. We have to take this one and put it into a linear factor form. So if there's a positive one there, this means that this one has to become x minus one. And what we have ourselves now, guys, after you do the first breakdown, is the funniest part. After you do the first breakdown of the polynomial by synthetic division, this is now called the depressed equation. Well, we broke down once. Now we have to break it down again. Okay, so that's called the depressed. Funny, but depression is not funny. Okay. Okay. So now, after the first breakdown, we always look at the polynomial that we just broke down from synthetic division, and we ask ourselves. Can this be factored by normal means? And if it can, great, we'll factor it. If it cannot be factored by normal means, then we have to throw it back into synthetic division again, and we get 12 attempts all over again, as I stated earlier. So our only hope is that, is this factorable? And the answer is, yes, this is factorable. The x minus 1 stays. And this polynomial is going to factor to 2x plus a number times x plus a number. And the only factors of 6 that can get me to 13 are going to be 1 and 6. I mean, check your work by foiling, of course. That's 2x squared, 12x, 1x, 13x, and 6. So guess what, guys? This is completely factored. There's nothing else we can do here. This is completely factored. So this means our answer is x minus 1 times 2x plus 1 times x plus 6. You have just taken that four-term polynomial and factored it into three linear factors. Now, let's just go ahead and find the remaining zeros, given the factor form, to show and to see what other zeros would have worked out of the potential zeros. So for this one we used, that's x equals 1. That worked off the bat. For this one, you'd get x equals negative 1 half. So what this means is that if we didn't use 1, then using negative 1 half would have worked in synthetic division. And then here you get x equals negative 6, which also means is that if you didn't use 1 or negative 1 half, negative 6 would have worked in synthetic division. And remember that the degree was 3? Well. How many zeros do we have? How many factors do we have? 
agree. There you go. And that is how you factor something that looks definitely unfactorable by using synthetic division and the potential zeros and everything else we've learned today. It's a good time. Until it's not, right? If you don't have a calculator and can't do the calculator trick, well, you better start going, plugging away on synthetic division. And the best thing is always start with one or negative one. If that doesn't work, then you go to two and negative two. If that doesn't work, then you go down the list of factors. Another trick is if you have fractions, start with the fractions. Sometimes they work all the time. As you see, we could have used negative one half and we would have got the same answer. Okay, um, let me just show you. I have time. Uh, let's say if we use negative one half instead. But okay, we'll use negative one half. Then in synthetic division, let's say we use negative one half instead of one on the first attempt. That number comes down. You get negative one, you'd get 10, you'd get negative five, you'd get negative 12, and then you'd get positive six with the remainder of zero. This would then factor to x plus one half and two x squared plus 10 x minus 12. And then you would have taken a two out of this one and we would have ended up at the same zeros as before. It definitely would have looked a little different you would have had two times x plus one half times x squared plus five x minus six. And two times x plus one half, this would factor to x plus six, x minus one. And these would give us the same zeros. Now, the reason it looks different is because we started with negative one half, but if, you distributed that two, it would have became that middle term. So that's the other options. And if you started with um, negative six, same result. We would have ended up at the same zeros. So it doesn't matter what zero you start with, you're gonna to get to the same answer as long as you follow the process. Okay, let's keep moving. I'll leave that there, that's fine. Okay, let's try it again. So now look at this. This is one, two, three, four, five, six term polynomials. We've never factored six term polynomials, but today's lesson makes it possible. Hooray math, right? Okay, so let's get moving. The degree of this is five, which means we should have five zeros at the very end, possibly five factors as well. List your potential zeros. So P always belongs to the constant, negative 16. And Q always belongs to the leading coefficient where, thank goodness, we get one. Okay. Which means let's go ahead and list all the factors of our potential zeros. And for 16, plus or minus one, plus or minus two, plus or minus three, no, plus or minus four, no five, no six, no seven, plus or minus eight, uh, no nine, 10, 11, and last is plus or minus 16. Then find all the factors of one, thank goodness, plus or minus one. Then, for our potential zeros, you'll put these over each other. And P 
over Q Well, all of these numbers over one, thank goodness it's easy, is plus or minus one, plus or minus two, plus or minus four, plus or minus eight, and plus or minus 16. These are our potential zeros, and we have one, two, four, six, eight, ten. We have ten tries to get it right. You can use the calculator trick to see which one works off the bat. Uh, I wanna save time on my video. Maybe it won't save time, right? I'm just gonna pick one. Always start with one, no matter what. So I'll choose one and let's see if it works. Plug in the polynomial above, just the coefficients. All powers are accounted for as well. Five, four, three, two, one, okay. So 1, negative 5, 12, negative 24, 32, and negative 16. The first one comes down. The 1, and then I'll have 1 times 1, which is 1. That'll give me negative 4. That'll give me negative four, this will give me eight, and this will give me eight, and then I'll get negative 16, and then I'll get negative 16, this will give me 16, and then I'll get negative 16, and I'll get a remainder of zero. One for the win, oof, okay. So, this means let's go ahead and write the depressed equation. So start with the factor that we use of one. That becomes x minus one. And then start with the quotient next. Everything has been reduced by one. So we should get x to the fourth minus 4x cubed plus 8x squared minus 16x plus 16. And now, once again, we look at the polynomial on the inside and we ask ourselves, can we factor that by normal means, by grouping or by regular guess and test method? And the answer is no, because this is one, two, three, four, five terms. So this means that we have to take the inside polynomial and throw it back into synthetic division. So that means we throw it back into synthetic division. Which means we have 10 choices for potential zeros again. 10 choices. Ooh. First, I'll just rewrite this polynomial down below. One, oops. One, negative four, eight, negative 16 and 16. This first number comes down and we get 10 choices again. Oh goodness, which means we have to think of what number is gonna work. Oh man, and this is where you can use the calculator trick again or start with one or negative one. Uh, let's see, if I choose one again, I'll get one, negative three, negative three, five, five, negative 11, one's not gonna work. So one is out. What if I chose negative one? Then if I choose negative one, I'll get negative one, which gives me negative five, five, which gives me 13, negative 13 gives me negative 29. That's not gonna work either. So I have exhausted one and negative one. Which means we can move on to two. Let's try two out. If I do two, two times one gives me two. There's negative two. There is negative four, which gives me four. There's eight, which gives me negative eight. And then there's negative 16, which gives me that remainder of zero. All right, 
I should be keeping everything the same color. So one moment, negative two, four, negative eight, zero. Okay, this time two worked as a factor. So we have another breakdown and we have another version of the depressed equation. The first thing we should start out with is the first linear factor we used. The next thing we should bring down is the second linear factor we divided by. And then the last piece is the quotient. which is now reduced by another power. So now this becomes x cubed minus 2x squared plus 4x minus 8. OK. Now, we've broken it down twice, which means that we look at the inside term, and we ask ourselves, can it be factored by normal means, or do we have to throw it into synthetic division again? And lucky for us, this is a four-term polynomial, which can hopefully be factored by grouping. So let's try it out. I'll rewrite these terms over here. x minus 1, x minus 2. I'll put a bracket for neatness, and I'll put these two terms together, those two terms together, and if it doesn't work out, then we have to go back to synthetic division. And from x cubed minus 2x squared, I'll take an x squared out, which will leave me with x minus 2. From 4x minus 8, I'll take a 4 out, a positive 4. That'll leave me with x minus 2. And hey, this is going to work out just fine. These factors are the same, which means you can factor them out. And we'll get x minus 1 times x minus 2 times x minus 2 times x squared plus 4. Now, all we have to do is clean it up, and we get our final answer of x minus 2 squared times x squared plus 4, I'm putting the squares first, and x minus 1. That is our final factored form. And you realize we didn't factor the x squared plus 4 because it's a sum of squares, which is unfactorable. If it was a difference of squares, we could factor it more. OK, now if we look at our zeros, well, here's some fun stuff. Well, this one is x equals 2, which would have a multiplicity of 2. It shows up twice. So if we wanted to do synthetic division one more time, we could have used 2 again. This one is x equals 1, the first one we used. <clears throat> now this one, here's the crazy part. If you solve this for x, you'll get x squared equals negative 4, where if you square root it, you'll get x equals plus or minus 2. Now my question for you is, did you see a 2i anywhere in the list of those potential rational zeros? And that answer is no. But, but they would work. 2i and negative 2i would work in synthetic division. It's crazy, but it works. OK. But all we really want are real zeros today. We don't want anything imaginary. I just wanted to show you that. And remember, our degree was 5, so we should have 5 zeros no matter what. 
remember that two shows up twice. So you'd have two zeros there, two zeros there, and one zero there. Five zeros all together. And that's factored. That's it. So use the calculator trick if you want. I mean, that it, using the calculator means you're using the rational zeros theorem, the remainder theorem, and the factor theorem. But once again, it could be a step that's too extra because you got to type the function in the calculator, and then you got to see what zero works, and then you got to throw in the synthetic division. Why not? Do what I did on this one. Just start with one and work from there. If one doesn't work, go negative one. If those don't work, go two and negative two. If those doesn't work, go to the next factors till you hopefully don't exhaust all 10 or 12 or 15 or 30 of them. But that's how you work these. Okay, one more left. Let me text my other class. We're gonna be late. So <clears throat> let's do it again on this one, but this time we're going to graph it. So in order to graph this function, we're going to have to break it down by doing everything we've done today. We list the multiplicities, turning points, cross touch, all that good stuff. But let's start off by breaking this polynomial function down. Okay. So graph the following function. So step one. Let's see, let's say step one here is we have to break it down first. So our degree is five, which is odd. Actually, yeah, this is step A, not step one. Degree is five, which is odd, because we're doing end behavior. And then the leading coefficient is four, which is positive. So if you have a odd degree, but positive leading coefficient, then you'll open bottom left, top right, right? Bottom left, top right. There's your end behavior. Okay. Now we can go on to B, which will involve everything we've done today. B, find your x-intercepts. Oh boy. That means we're gonna look for the zeros here. So we're gonna say x-intercepts. Of course, you let the function equal zero. And the first thing we're gonna look for is potential zeros. So remember, p belongs to the constant, which is five. And q belongs to the leading coefficient, which is four. Now let's list all of those potential zeros. Plus or minus one, plus or minus five. List all the potential zeros of four, plus or minus one, plus or minus two, plus or minus four. Then we'll put P over Q. and take all the factors of P and put them over Q. So we'll start with one and five. You'll get plus or minus one, plus or minus, uh, let's see, five. And then now we'll put them over two, plus or minus one half, plus or minus five halves. And then we'll put them over four, plus or minus one fourth, plus or minus five-fourths. Okay. And then we'll set up for synthetic division. So let's look at the original function. I'll just put that right here next to it. And 
we're missing a lot of powers, right? Three and two, not that much. So you'll have 4x to the fifth, negative 20x to the fourth. We're missing x cubed. We're missing x squared. We have negative x, and we have 5. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. And then the first number always comes down. Okay, well, who's going to work here? Let's see, negative 1 and 5. So if I choose 1, you get negative 16, 16, 16, 16. 15. I don't think that's going to work. If I choose 5, that might work. Let's see, we get 20, 0, 0, 0, 5. No, we still get 0. And we'll get, I think 5 is going to work. So let me see. I'll choose 5. And then that'll give me 20, which will give me 0, and then 0. Zero, 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 negative one, and then negative five. So we get a remainder of zero. Okay, that worked out. So that means this will become, bring this down, x minus 5, and we reduced everything by 1, so you'll have 4x to the 4th minus 1. That's not bad. 4x to the 4th minus 1. Okay, now we ask, can we factor more? And the answer is yes. That's a difference of squares. So this means that this would factor to x minus 5 times 2x squared plus 1 and 2x squared minus 1. 4x squared, 4x to the 4th, negative 2x squared, positive 2 squared, negative 1. Okay. And now this is completely factored. So here is our factored form. I'll just box it. We can't factor anymore. And then we can solve for the x-intercepts finally. Okay. Let's keep this here. Well, one is given for my x-intercepts. You get x equals five, which would be five, zero. For this one, it's not going to work out so much. <clears throat> You'll get 2x squared plus 1 equal to 0. 2x squared equal negative 1. x squared equals negative 1 half. And we can stop there because if you square root, you'll get imaginary x-intercepts, which we don't need. And then for this one, you'll get 2x squared minus 1 equal to 0. 2x squared equals 1. x squared equals 1 half. And we'll get the square root, which will give me x equals plus or minus. And remember, by radical properties, this can become square root one over square root two, which becomes one over the square root of two. Or if you rationalize, we get square root two over two. And to plot that on the graph, we're gonna need the decimal number, which is 0.71. which means that we'll have x-intercepts at negative 0.71 and 0, and 0.71 and 0. Oh boy, 
All right. Well, hey, wasn't that fun? Now we get to find the y-intercept, which is the easiest. y-intercept, you'll x equals zero. So let's come up to the original function. And that'll be zero, that'll be zero, that'll be zero. So our y-intercept is just at five. Okay, x-intercept's done, y-intercept's done. Determine multiplicities on all their numbers. So that's gonna be c. Let's go ahead and look at our zeros. So for c, our multiplicities. So for five zero, five zero, that just has a multiplicity of one. which means we cross. And then 0.71 and negative 0.71 also have a multiplicity of one. So actually, we can just say this, 0 0.710 and negative 0 0.710. All of these have a multiplicity of one, which means all of these will cross. Okay. And then turning points, our degree was five. So for turning points, degree was five, you always subtract one. So there will be four turning points. And last is the graph, we made it. <laughs> okay, so I've got an x-intercept at five and 0 0.71 and negative 0 0.71. So let's plot those. Five, there's my first one. And then 0.71, I'll put right there and negative 0.71 I'll put right there. Doesn't have to be perfect. Okay. And then we also have a y-intercept at five as well, zero five. So one, two, three, right there. And now we know that my M behavior starts at the bottom left. Starts at the bottom left and we'll finish top right. So here we go. Let me zoom in. And this is what we're gonna have. Cross, cross, cross. And there it is. That was a combination of what we did in five, what was it, five one, five two, graphing the polynomial by its characteristics, but this time to find the x-intercepts, we had to use the rational zeros theorem with synthetic division. But you see how everything comes together now. Characteristics of polynomials, sketching it based on multiplicities, synthetic division, rational zeros theorem, hey, these are all connected, so these are things we should know, and hopefully it shouldn't be too difficult, not like this problem. <laughs> but other than that, this is done, and it's a lot of fun. Good times. I will see you at the next one.